to introduce our speaker, uh, Anna Taylor. Anna is another um, of our UCT uh, products, if you like. She did her bachelor's in honors um, here at UCT. And then did some community, does that community development work in West Africa. And worked in the UK for, for a number of years for the Stockholm Environment Institute, working on climate related issues. And then about six years ago, she came back to the University of Cape Town, um, initially just as a, as a researcher, but then uh, started a PhD in a very interesting program um, called the MISTRA Urban Futures Program, which was a partnership between the university and the city. The MISTRA Urban Futures Program. MISTRA. MISTRA. MI. It stands for a big funder from Sweden. Sweden. You gave us lots of money. <laughs> um, one thing they did fund was a, a, a cohort of students such as Anna doing their PhD research embedded in the city. So they're actually working full time in the city, almost as an additional resource to the city to some extent, but then also at the same time doing their research around particular issues that the city was uh, dealing with with regards to climate change. So um, Anna is probably one of the few people who has a deep understanding of what the city has been doing, but also has a kind of outside view, um, sort of from an academic point of view. And I think some of what you're going to talk about uh, comes from her PhD. So if you just welcome her. Only due in two months' time or a month and a half's time, yes. so we should be safe, I think. I'll use it as my excuse to avoid any particularly difficult questions, though. <laughs> I want to induce early labour through stress. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction, and thank you all for having me. Um, and yeah, as Mark said, I'm going to try and sort of base my talk around this knowledge that I've developed over the last four years of working very closely with and sort of inside of the city of Cape Town, but without actually being a formal city of Cape Town employee, but rather as a UCT researcher involved in a formal knowledge partnership with the city, which has given me this unique opportunity to be a kind of insider outsider. Um, and so my talk is very much based around uh, the knowledge I have acquired and developed um, in that sort of interesting position of having one foot in each camp. And so the, the title of the talk is how a complex organization such as the city of Cape Town responds to a wicked problem like climate change. So just to give you a sense of what I'm gonna cover, um, first I'm gonna look at why climate change constitutes a wicked problem, what a wicked problem is in the first place. And then why the city of Cape Town definitely constitutes what we'd call a very complex organization. Um, then I'm going to qu quickly talk about what Cape Town is doing to tackle climate change, but not at a very detailed level, because hopefully all of you, most of you were here on Wednesday, and that's what Helen Davies spoke about in great detail. So I'm going to take what she said and sort of zoom out a bit to try and make sense of it. Um, and then focus more on the how they're going about doing all those things that she spoke about um, that they are doing. And then take that into a more comparative mode to so say, okay, well, how does what Cape Town's doing stack up against um, other reference points? And we'll talk about how we do that kind of comparison. And then try and bring it back to Cape Town by saying, okay, well, based on comparing Cape Town elsewhere, um, what what does that suggest Cape Town should be possibly doing more or less of? So it's a little bit looking ahead at what we could, what we could try and do better. So I must apologize, these are not gonna be the most beautiful slides you've ever seen, and there's, it breaks all the rules in terms of how much text there should be on one slide. But please don't think you have to, I, I will talk you through them. It's as much for my benefit as for yours. Um, so first of all, why is climate change a wicked problem? Well, this idea of a wicked problem developed in the 70s, not specific to climate change, um, but people working in social policy fields more generally, who coined this term wicked problem, not wicked as in evil, but wicked as in very difficult to tame. So they talk about tame problems and wicked problems. Um, and wicked problems in the sense of resisting resolution. They don't have a clear solution that can be deemed sort of 
um, optimal and thereby having solved the problem. So some of the characteristics of wicked problems is that they're very interconnected with other problems, so they're very difficult to sort of delineate and pin down. And I think probably from what you've heard this week, climate change, it's very easy to argue why climate change is one of those. It's connected to poverty in terms of who's impacted worst. It's linked to issues of population growth and energy use and traffic congestion and increasing emissions and water security and food security. So it really is this complex of problems. There are no simple cause and effect relationships that one can um, identify that explain the problem and therefore suggest a clear kind of objective objectively optimal solution to the problem. It's not that kind of problem. So climate change, again, is clearly one of those. There are multiple sources of greenhouse gas emissions that, ge that generate, drive the anthropogenic part of climate change, and that in turn interacts in complex ways with the natural processes that drive changes in the climate. There are multiple impacts from those changes in the climate, and there are multiple ways both of trying to curb those emissions and deal with the impact. So there's just a multiplicity of issues at play, um, which makes it very wicked and difficult to tame. Um, because it's difficult to delineate, people have very differing um, perspectives and opinions of the problem, which makes them very hot, political, contested problems which we've seen massively in the case of, of climate change internationally and continues to be. I mean, in some ways, with the recent inauguration of Trump, that's going to flare up again because he's been one of the primary kind of skeptics. And while we had a phase of stabilizing some of that international politics, I think it's now going to be a little bit fraught again. But at least we've made lots of progress in the interim, so hopefully not too damaging. Um, and then. If, because of this complexity and these feedbacks and interconnections, addressing wicked problems is difficult because you can't, you can't sort of isolate it and then do controlled experiments because the problem is so um, dynamic in many respects. So every time you intervene, you're effectively changing the nature of the problem. So it's very difficult to um, sort of learn by trial and error and resolve it in that sense. And therefore, because of all those characteristics, it, it, wicked problems are very difficult to, or sort of unsolvable in the sense that because they change and connect with many others, it's difficult to imagine an end state where it's not a problem anymore um, and to claim success of having, the, having resolved the problem and the problem being behind us. So it's rather a case of ongoing efforts at addressing it, tackling it, improving it, that often look quite different. They're very context specific. It looks different tackling climate change depending on where you are. So I hope that's convinced you that climate change definitely constitutes a wicked problem. Some have even taken it a step further to say it's what should be called a super wicked problem, which is just upping the ante even further. So a few academics um, have said we should, we should sort of deem it a special category of wicked problem. Um, and some of the reasons they've given are because of the kind of temporal element, that there is a sense that there are these thresholds, and if we exceed some of those, we'll get into sort of territory where we, you know, we can't sustain life as we know it. Um, that there's no central authority that can be mandated with tackling the problem. That those seeking to solve the problem are also part of causing the problem. So we've got this very complicated set of relationships in terms of the sort of um, most perpetrators and victims of the problem. Um, and there's this temporal element in that we're needing to act now, but with n some knowledge of the future, and yet we're, in, we're stuck in this problem where we massively discount the future in favor of doing what seems to be the best thing for kind of the current time or the current generation. Um, so those have been some of the reasons that have been given f to call it a super wicked problem. I think that's probably unnecessary. Just calling a wicked problem is bad enough, in my view. OK, so then the city of Cape Town. Why is it such a complex organization? So I think you probably have a fairly good sense of this if many of you have been in Cape Town for a long time and show some interest in sort of politics and how the city works. But just as a recap, it is 
it, just its sheer size makes it complex. It is a massive organization compared to most many others. Um, and what's complicated about it is that it's made up of both these, both the political part of the organization and the sort of technical administrative part of the organization. So in the political sphere of the city of Cape Town, we have an executive mayor, we have a deputy, an executive deputy mayor, we have a mayoral committee made up of senior councillors. We very recently now apparently have four mini mayors, which is, has just been introduced, which are which relate to the regions, north, south, east, west of Cape Town. We have 116 ward councillors, 115 proportional representative councillors that represent the various political parties. So we have a full council of 231 people, and then guided by a speaker and a chief whip within the council. That's the political side. Then we've got the administrative side of the city of Cape Town, headed by a city manager and a deputy city manager, with something in the order of 27,000 employees. I and mean, that is massive by most uh, standards, I would have said, who are divided into 47 different departments um, and headed by a sort of executive management team. And of course, there are many uh, um, teams and committees and various things that attempt sort of integration amongst them. And then at the interface of the political and the, and the administrative body sit um, primarily 21 different committees which are the places where the politicians and the technical officials and administrators meet to discuss business. Um, and then also a fairly recent addition to the city, probably two or three years ago, was something called the Strategic Policy Unit, which was introduced sort of with a foot in both camps as well, very much answerable to the mayor's office, but um, with a mandate to try and streamline and integrate policy development and policy implementation across the city, acknowledging that it deals with so many different issues and departments. Um, and then to add to that complexity, obviously, that council and administration is democratically representative of and answerable to all of us, plus, 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 so a population nearing 4 million. At, in the tw 2011 census, it was 3.74 million, but with some recognition that probably a few people weren't counted. Um, and we all know that that's a very diverse population and a fairly unequal population in terms of how well serviced and catered for they are by the city based on historical um, conditions. So the DA is very much in the driving seat in the council with 66.7%, and then the ANC has about 24%, and then there are 11 other parties who have very marginal sort of one, two, or three seats within the council. But the point is it is still quite a, a broad, broad church, so to speak, in terms of political views being represented that have to be accounted for within the, the council. Um, and so, yeah, this, this issue of you know, very high levels of diversity amongst both the political and administrative members of the city of Cape Town. And I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but in my experience, some level of kind of mistrust of each other in the sense that everybody's vying to have influence over how decisions are made and everybody's slightly mistrusting of each other that they're trying to put a spanner in the works of their respective issue or um, project. And so there's quite a lot of, um, it's kind of quite an edgy organization to work within because of all these dynamics. And then to add further to the complexity, it's very geographically dispersed in that the council has tens of big office blocks that people reside in, more, I mean, probably, yeah, I'm not sure exact number, but lots of different buildings that they sit in, which are everywhere from the city center all the way out to the perimeter of the city. Um, so they don't physically, they're not physically co-located, which also makes coordination very difficult. Um, on top of that, the city's currently going through a massive organizational redesign in terms of how they divide up uh, all these people and organize all these people. And that's the latest of a number of phases of reorganization. 
Since the city was unified in 2000, after the local elections, um, as you know, within the big process of kind of uh, breaking down the apartheid legacy in terms of how government was structured. So in some ways, the city of Cape Town as one mega complex organization is actually quite young in terms of figuring out all these um, systems and processes and is very much, is quite dynamic in the sense that they're changing quite a lot to try and move away from the past and figure out what works and what doesn't in this new um, unified single uh, metropolitan municipality. And then, of course, just in case we needed to add any more complexity, local government is nested within uh, provincial and national government. Um, and they're you know, complex divisions of mandates between them as guided by the constitution. But it's still, as I say, it's fairly new. So everybody's still trying to work out exactly what that division is and contest some of those divisions and realize that there are actually a few gaps between you know, where one mandate ends and the other one begins. Um, but then is also governed by this idea of cooperative governance. So the city has to align its policies and plans with policies and legislation at the provincial and national level. So basically, it's a very difficult space to operate in. And, and I must say, my time with them has given me great admiration and respect for the jobs, that, the, the very difficult jobs that many of uh, the city officials and politicians have to navigate. So hopefully that's convinced you we have a complex problem, or a wicked problem, and a complex organization. Um, then, as I said, I, I don't want to focus, I want to focus more on the how Cape Town's tackling climate change than the what it's doing. But Helen, I think, took you through quite a whistle-stop tour, but an amazing overview of all the different things that the city is doing um, to tackle climate change. So hopefully you were all around for that. And so just to kind of zoom out a little bit from what she said, I think what's interesting is she didn't mention anything about the temporal dimension, which I'm particularly interested in and my research is focused on. And I can trace back to very soon after the Unicity was formed, around 2001, there's an environmental policy, the, the Integrated Metropolitan Environmental Policy, IMEP, that mentions the need for a climate change strategy. So climate change kind of appears on, formally on the Cape Town radar as far back as 2001, and obviously slightly preceding that in order to draft the policy that it appears in. But then if you look at the activity, it really picks up around 2004, 2005, and more and more stuff starts happening. Um, and I'd say there has been a kind of proliferation of activity in the last 10 years, I think, we can definitely, it's easy to make the argument that Cape Town, the city of Cape Town has been doing stuff on climate change for over 10 years. And then Helen walked you through all the different sectors that are um, doing, taking various measures to address climate change. So I've just summarized them here using the ones she gave us. So transport, spatial planning, water, human settlements and housing, biodiversity, stormwater, disaster risk management, coastal management, electricity and energy, and she didn't actually mention health, but there is some health activity going on, although that's primarily a provincial mandate. So a huge diversity of sectors within the city that have climate change on their radar and are doing something about, you know, some, something that could be said to be related to climate change. And then what, those something it, what that something is breaks down into very many types of, of interventions. So everything from developing strategies around how to tackle climate change um, and energy issues, more detailed plans around what specific interventions and sort of operational measures will be taken, lots of projects that have been funded and are either completed or underway that deal with either um, altering infrastructure, so she was talking about pipe dimensions in the case of stormwater, um, doing various kinds of assessments, risk assessments, really trying to figure out what, is the, what does the nature of climate change look like at the local level in Cape Town, particularly around coastal and sea level rise and all these sorts of assessments that, that sort of um, try and quantify the risks associated with climate change for Cape Town. They've developed sectoral policies, which include climate change as one 
um, informant of those sectoral policies. And then one of Helen's big tasks at the moment that she spoke a lot about at the start of her presentation is around developing a consolidated climate change policy, um, which is currently under revision. So there's a draft policy that is available on the website, and they've gone through public participation at the end of last year. So maybe some of you saw it and hopefully provided some input. I know we organized a workshop here at UCT to try and get people to engage with it and uh, provide some feedback. And then the city's been developing lots of networks, so locally, nationally, internationally, connecting with other cities around the world that are addressing climate change. Um, that's been a big um, string to their bow in terms of trying to tackle climate change, sort of signing up to various conventions and agreements internationally that say Cape Town will take a stand on climate change. And then, as I mentioned, this organizational redesign, which is kind of going through various iterations that formulate, that, that has given rise to things like the strategic policy unit, which tries to integrate and mainstream climate change with a whole bunch of other issues. Um, these things called transversal working groups, of which there is one that's called GEEK, rather humorously, but that stands for Green Economy, Energy and Climate Change, which again tries to take people from all these different departments and line functions and get better coordination amongst them. And then there's a very new, so with this whole uh, reorganization of the council that's, that DeLille announced two weeks ago, there's now also a sustainability and resilience committee that the politicians and the administrators will uh, convene to talk about what they're doing on that front, and climate change will definitely be on the agenda there. So that's the that's kind of an, uh, an even more of an overview of what the city is doing that Helen provided lots of detail on. Um, but now I want to turn to this question of how, which starts off the you know the title of my talk is is focused on the how. Um, so how is it that Cape Town has been doing all this stuff for ten years or more? Um, and, and how do they go about trying to do it? Well, it's very much been championed and led from within the Environmental Resource Management Department, which is one of those 47 departments that make up the city of Cape Town. Um, so it was into their environmental policy, their environmental policy that they drafted, but of course the whole council had to adopt, um, or didn't have to, chose to adopt in 2001 that said that climate change should be a priority and will be something that the city will tackle. Um, but that has, so that was it, entirely necessary that somebody took the lead, but it has proved somewhat problematic in that it means that, it has meant that in many people's minds, climate change is an environmental problem. It's a green problem, it's a sustainability problem which many in the city and beyond still think of as somewhat different from, a from an economic or a social development issue. So we still sit, it has changed over time, but the sense that environment issues somehow compete with development and it puts the brakes on development and it means people want green spaces, not more housing, and it means that you can't drive your car as much. And so there's been a kind of stigma a little bit attached to climate change because of its environmental associations, which has proved problematic and kind of generated some early resistance that it's one of those first impressions last kind of situations. But there has, it, it has improved over time. But I think that, so it was, it was absolutely necessary and Fantastic that the environment department took the lead and somebody had to introduce it, but it has made it difficult to mainstream into the rest of the city, I think, because of that. What the city has done a lot of, which is also a very necessary step in the process, is this assessment and trying to figure out exactly, sort of get a much better sense of what the problem of climate change, which is often talked about in a very global sense, looks like in Cape Town. So where does it manifest in Cape Town? How soon might we be seeing these changes? If we look back in the historical records, can we start to see some of this um, change signal coming through? So they've done quite a lot of assessment work and then quite a lot of work in terms of identifying options for tackling climate change both mitigation and adaptation. So how can we reduce Cape Town's emissions? Is it through transport? Is it through electricity supplies? Is it through renewable energy? You know, all those sorts of things. Or to, 
to what extent is it a combination of those? And similarly with adaptation, do we invest in stormwater management? Is it about drought and water scarcity? So really trying to look for options that are effective in tackling climate change. But I think where Cape Town hasn't gotten to enough is the next phase, which is around then having this huge basket of options available. Because it's a wicked problem, it has lots of um, ways of trying to tackle it. And there hasn't been very much in the way of, although recognition that this is needed, to prioritize and sequence. So now we've got the, you know, a list of um, tens, if not hundreds, of ways that we could start tackling various elements of climate change. But the question is, we can't do all of them right now because of financial reasons, because of the complexity of the organization and introducing them, because maybe some are less important than others. So this question of how to prioritize between options and how to sequence them over time is proving a tricky step in the process, um, not only for Cape Town, for many other places, and we'll come to that. Helen on Wednesday also spoke a lot about financing, that one of the sticking points for Cape Town is a fairly limited budget because we know all about you know, how many taxpayers there are and how much money there is in the fiscus and how it gets allocated from national level and how many people pay rates in Cape Town and all that sort of thing. There is a finite amount of money and lots of problems to tackle climate change being one of many, you know, poverty, job creation, uh, traffic congestion, public transport. The peop people within the city are vying for that money in all sorts of ways to roll out the projects that they think are most important. And climate change doesn't always seem to feature high up on that list. And that's where the issue around sort of integration and mainstreaming is very important. Because I think a lot of people, going back to the first point, still see climate change as, oh, it's an environmental issue. It's an additional thing. It's a standalone. Money either goes to climate change or it goes to public transport, which is not entirely true, because it's how you roll out your public transport, what kind of public transport you roll out, that obviously affects emissions and whether the infrastructure gets hammered on the coast or by a heavy rainfall or whatever. So, but that mentality, that, that sort of integrated way of looking at it from a systems perspective isn't totally there yet. I think the environment people totally get it. I think many people within the city get it, the spatial planners get it, but it's still, yeah, there's still this tension about whether climate change is sort of a standalone thing that is drawing money from other things or whether it can really be fully integrated. Um, as I mentioned already, Cape Town is very much connecting up with others through networks, which I think is a very positive sign. And one of the ways it's going about addressing climate change is to sort of come out and make these bold statements about we have ambitions and we stand alongside the other cities of the world and we think it's an important issue and we're gonna all try and figure out together what we can do about it. So I think that's been a very important, um, uh, yeah, part of the picture. And there's kind of a healthy competition between cities. So no city wants to be seen, and particularly Cape Town has a, has a major kind of reputation status aspect to it. Um, and Cape Town doesn't want to be seen as the one who's kind of falling behind, both on the national uh, stage. So there's quite healthy competition between Cape Town and Durban, particularly on who's kind of the biggest or the, the best or the most, um, doing the most on climate change particularly, um, to a lesser extent Joburg. And then, um, but then internationally as well, you know, these networks are New York and London and Rotterdam and uh, Melbourne. And so Cape Town wants to play on the global stage of cities kind of doing things, doing things right. Um, and so that's really sort of pushing, pushing the boundary locally as well as internationally, which I think is good. But then what's difficult in relation to that is this thing of, trying to strike the balance between being quite ambitious and signing these big agreements and setting quite ambitious, signing up to ambitious targets and you know, really putting the city out there as somebody who, you know, as a city that's trying to lead on this issue, while facing resistance and many other priorities internal to the city which are entirely justified and understandable, as I say. Um, tackling poverty, creating employment, all these other issues that can be linked to climate change but are not core climate change issues. 
And so I think Helen didn't say it, but the intimation and the way they try and frame the, pol the climate change policy is to sort of balance this thing of being quite ambitious and, and um, putting Cape Town on the global stage and sort of uh, encouraging the residents of Cape Town and the voters that this is an important issue that, that we should be tackling while at the same time being quite conservative and sort of resistant to change and not convinced that climate change is the number one priority that it should be focusing on. So, so I think the Environment Department has tried very hard at mainstreaming and integrating climate change both horizontally through the organization, so making sure that through the sort of the ranks of the administration and up into the political sphere, climate change is seen as more and more of an important issue. And then also vertically, oh no, sorry, that that's vertically, and then also horizontally in terms of all the different sectors and departments and making sure that all the, the, the issues that relate to climate change are addressed. Um, but that is, it's difficult, and I wouldn't say like, that battle hasn't been won. Um, it's still, you know, when, the, when, the, when the tough times come and their budget cuts happening, people retreat from climate change as an issue and they say, oh, that's the environment department's business, you know, that's not really what we're doing. So there's still some way to go on that front. Interestingly, it's very clear when you look at this temporal dimension of what the city has been doing that events are often a key um, enabler, a, a sort of window of opportunity to do more. Um, and I, I think it relates to that, what's the saying about you can't miss a good crisis or what it, something to that effect? Got to you, you harness a good crisis. Um, but actually it's on both fronts. It's not just crisis events, although those have been influential. So for example, there was a very big flood event in 2004, which um, sparked a lot of activity, particularly around stormwater in Cape Town and tackling, you know, trying to think about are these intense rainfall events likely to happen more often? Can we see any evidence in the historical record of them becoming more frequent? Is flooding becoming more of a big issue in Cape Town? And therefore, what are the kinds of things we need to do to start addressing uh, flooding, not only through hard infrastructure, like increasing pipe diameters, but also through restoring wetlands, clearing riverways, you know, getting rid of alien vegetation, canalizing some rivers, decanalizing other rivers to try and slow down flow, trying to set more stringent buffer zones around rivers so that we don't get as much development very close to rivers that we know are going to periodically flood. So, so an event like a, a, a flood in 2004, and then equally on the other end of the spectrum, I think the current drought that we're in is also kind of generating a lot of energy and attention and awareness that has a climate change dimension to it. Um, and hopefully sort of edges knowledge and behavior in a new direction. But then equally, other kinds of events. So for example, um, Cape Town vied very hard to host um, what's called the COP, which is the Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the big international climate change agreement. And so every year, all the countries that have signed up to, and even those that haven't signed up, but Basically, the UN, uh, everybody who's a UN member meets to discuss what a country's doing on climate change, and that's held in a different city each year. And in 2011, it was coming to Cape, it was coming to South Africa, because it moves around various regions, and basically Cape Town and Durban fought it out for who would host it. Durban won, so COP17 was hosted in Durban in 2011, but all the competition around trying to host the event and then showcase the city as a city that's doing stuff on climate change really created a lot of energy and awareness and opportunity and you know, a bit of extra money and a bit of extra political attention. And so you, you can see these sort of spurts in terms of amount of activity within Cape Town going on um, related to climate change. And then I could give other examples, like the World Design Capital in 2014, but you get the gist of it. So those events are, are important. Um, but again, problematic, because you end up with these kind of 
focal times where a lot happens and then it kind of dissipates for a while and things stagnate a bit and nobody can quite remember what it was that they were doing or why and then it takes quite a bit of time to pick up the energy again. So it's not, yeah, it's not always a good thing, but we'll get back to that. Then I think the important thing is to say that champions and what in the literature is often referred to as policy entrepreneurs are key. Often, you know, the city of Cape Town tends to, as an as a organization, take credit for um, being on the world stage as a city that is doing some stuff around climate change. But actually, that is only possible because of the energies of not that many individuals who really you know, make it their personal ambition to tackle an issue like this and kind of read a lot about it and get all the connections and f work very hard and literally fight very hard within their roles to make some progress, get some budget, make some projects happen, build some partnerships. Um, and so I think we mustn't lose sight that th those individuals are key um, which, which is good and bad, though. So a lot from what I, just in the time that I've been around Cape Town, I can see the danger to that is people kind of burn out and get quite disillusioned because it's really hard work, because not everybody's convinced that this is the most important issue. And equally, they also pull in quite different directions. So most of the people who take up those championing roles are quite strong-willed and kind of, um, singular in their vision and ambitious and want to see what they um, sort of have envision, envisioned as uh, the potential solution enacted. And so there's often quite a lot of, you know, sort of um, tension and battling it out for, for whose project and policy, you know, version of the policy, whatever, should... Um, should be, sorry, I'm just watching the time, trying to make sure I don't get too stuck on these points. Um, make sure there's some time for questions. So yeah, again, a sort of um, great that there, those people exist because otherwise we'd be not very far at all, but also recognizing that that has some uh, difficulties and drawbacks as well. And we end up lo often losing those people because they feel like they're fighting an uphill battle. Um, and then uh, maybe associated with that point is, if you look at Cape, what Cape Town is doing, actually it's quite fragmented. There is a lot going on, but it's not that consistent. I wouldn't say it's kind of been strategically envisaged and sort of this, this issue of prioritization and sequencing. It's more the kind of let many flowers bloom approach. I think pr pragmatically so, that's the way it, it had to be, in part because climate change hasn't been a sort of top-down priority. It's not that the leadership in the city said climate change is going to be one of our flagship issues and kind of decreed from on high. It's rather that it's been bubbling up from various quarters within particularly the administration of the city. Um, and people have been trying to sort of push it up the organization and across the organization. And so there's lots of stuff happening, but even Helen mentions, you know, often in pilot phases and it kind of, there's the stop and start phenomenon as events come and go. And so it's, I think, it, sort of the, if I was in more critical mode, I think there's been quite poor coordination and sort of strategic leadership on the issue of climate change in Cape Town. I think it's unfair to assume that that can ever be done by one person, whether it's the mayor or Helen as head of environment, you know, climate change policy or whatever. It's much a big, because it's such a big, wicked problem and a big complex organization, that's never going to fall to one person to be able to ensure that level of coordination. Um, and many forums and networks do exist, as I've mentioned, but the problem is there are lots of them and they're not very strategic and they end up being kind of forums where people report, but it's, very, it's kind of tick boxing. It's compliance driven. It's, it's, not, um, it's not very strategic and it's not, it's not very much fostered on kind of trying to learn from what's being done and join up the dots effectively. 
So on to the last part is this question of having heard all of that, how does Cape Town compare to other cities or how does Cape Town compare? So in my view, there are three ways that we can think about how Cape Town stacks up. The one is against other cities globally and you know, in South Africa, in Africa and globally. The second way to consider how Cape Town stacks up is against some kind of theoretical principles of what does the sort of the body of science tell us that addressing climate change should look like, and then how does Cape Town stack up against those theoretical principles? And then thirdly, comparing Cape Town to itself over time, is it generally getting better and making progress on tackling these issues? Um, it's difficult to do all three of those things, um, which I have learned through my own research, in part because there's actually quite poor information and data, both around what Cape Town does. It's not that well documented, but then equally very much so when comparing against other cities. Um, so some cities you know, collect their evidence base very effectively, other cities don't, so it's not really a fair comparison. Then equally, you're not comparing like and like, particularly between cities, because you've got very different political setups, administrative setups, territorial boundaries. Some cities are made up of lots of municipalities. Some are big mega, municip um, big mega sort of local governments. And there are various levels of decentralization. Some, have a lot, some cities have a lot of autonomy. Others are very much beholden to what their national governments tell them to do. And the amount of money flowing through these cities is very different. Um, and so all of that, you know, it's hard to weigh up all of those things when comparing. So you're not comparing like for like. Then with the theoretical comparison, translating theory into practice is difficult. And I'll touch on that. And equally, a lot of the theory around what it means for a city to address climate change is based on on empirical evidence from the global north. So it's learning from cities like New York and London and Copenhagen, which aren't like Cape Town. And so the theory is also, at least that's where you know, a lot of my research goes into arguing that we need to improve the theory based on how things happen in a place like Cape Town. And then also with these comparative things, there's a lot of kind of politics and diplomacy and you have to say, you know, you have to say nice things about other cities in, in terms of trying to encourage them to do more. And equally cities put out marketing material like there's no tomorrow in terms of trying to present themselves as the best on the block that isn't always um, substantially uh, backed up by what's happening on the ground. So you have to sort of take the comparison in light of all of those um, difficulties. So when comparing to other cities, one of the, way, one of the few um, sort of databases almost for doing that is um, an, a process of, of an awards competition that has been set up by a big international network of cities called C40 that was led initially by when um, Bloomberg was mayor of New York and he headed this big network. And then they teamed up with Siemens, um, who I think did a lot of the sort of data collection and analysis. And basically they tried to collect information about what are cities around the world doing on climate change and then give aw annual awards based on different categories to cities that are doing particularly well to tackle climate change. So, it gives you a good sense of which are the cities internationally that are being recognized as addressing climate change. And it is also somewhat interesting to look at the kinds of categories they are awarding cities on the basis of. So again, quite a diversity of things, everything from. And what I've highlighted in red in the table is how some of the categories change. So there have only been four years of awards so far. But you can see that categories changing over time, which also gives you a good sense of how the thinking around climate change is developing. So adaptation and resilience on the one hand, air quality, measuring carbon emissions, um, energy efficiency category, financing category, uh, sort of renewable energy category, smart cities, intelligent cities, sort of IT savvy cities, solid waste management, sustainable communities, and urban transportation. And you'll see uh, there's a fair diversity of cities that have been awarded 
the, these prizes, but places like New York and London and Melbourne come up quite a lot. Cape Town has won a prize, so that's clear that Cape Town is being recognized internationally by these big networks as doing something. Cape Town won last year uh, for all the efforts that it's put into water demand management and water conservation, interestingly, before the worst of the drought hit, um, but it has been recognized for progress on that front. And then Joburg also has won a prize on, around its green bond, issuing green bonds. Um, surprisingly, Durban hasn't, which is in some ways unfair on, uh, an unfair reflection on Durban, because they are doing a lot. Um, and then the only other city in Africa is Addis Ababa that won something around light rail and uh, in the transportation category. But so Cape Town is you know, one of the leading cities on the continent in terms of tackling climate change. And then the second way of doing it is against these theoretical principles. So if you look in the literature, there's some nice work that's been done by Wilby and Vaughan around what are the attributes of um, a municipality that's adapting well. And so that has things like it has clear champions in place, it has clearly stated objectives, it's done a lot of assessments on what the problem is, it's got guidance and training in place for how people, and that is you know, well-rooted in science, but it provides guidance for what they should be doing, that there's um, processes and structures in place to support learning so that we have this sort of evolution over time of, of what's being done. There are multiple networks in place and strong partnerships. There's good monitoring and reporting so that we know what's being done and that progress is being made and it can be sort of objectively verified from the outside that the stuff that stuff is going on. And then there's very good internal and external communication about the nature of the problem and what's being done to tackle it and the progress that's being made. So that's what they sort of suggest it should look like. That focuses on the adaptation side. Of course, the mitigation side is somewhat easier in that you can look at what are the emissions of a city and determine whether they're going up or down. So we'd have to add that into the mix to make it climate change as a whole. And then I would argue what it sort of doesn't emphasize strongly is also broader principles like equity, you know, that, that you don't have this case of of some of a city being highly, highly vulnerable and massively impacted and unable to cope with impacts and others not. Um, and then these sort of broader principles of resilience. Um, learning is, I think, covered, but ideas of sort of diversity and flexibility and these broader principles that mean that a system is, is able to deal with change effectively. And so, just to kind of try and conclude quite quickly, I think Cape Town in many respects stacks up very well on all three of these ways of comparing. It's been doing stuff on climate change for a fairly long time. It's really working hard at trying to balance both the mitigation and the adaptation agenda, although it started off very strongly focusing on mitigation, just like most of the other cities around the world did, but now they've really tried to bring the adaptation agenda more strongly into play. There is a diversity of sectors and interventions being engaged and, and sort of implemented to some extent, at least thought about. It's being elevated to the policy level. So as I said, Cape Town now has its draft climate change policy that's going through the review. It's been through public participation. It's yet to go to council, but the hope is that council will adopt it. That's fairly unique. Not very many cities have a policy at the city scale on climate change. I think that sets Cape Town apart to some extent. It's very well networked. It has lots of engagements through these networks. And if you look over time, there has definitely been a proliferation of activity and an elevation. So I think it is slowly becoming more strategic. So I think Cape Town stacks up pretty well on that front. Although the graph on the right shows you that in terms of mitigation specifically, the numbers, if you look at between 2001 and 2012, are not that different. I mean, they're sitting between five and six um, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita emissions. So we know, it's not like we can say we've radically reduced Cape Town's greenhouse gas emissions over the last 10 years. So that leads us to the but part of it. So Cape Town looks good on many fronts, but if you compare it to many others, the amount of money that's actually going into implementing these things is really not very much. Um, 
yes, the mayor talks about climate change and the sort of, I don't, I don't know how much the city manager does, but I would say there hasn't been an amazing amount of strategic leadership on the issue. If anything, it's been coming from below within the organization with difficulty in terms of mainstreaming and integrating um, it. You could argue it's not being ambitious enough um, in terms of what it's setting out to do. And then, but at the same time, it's doing a lot. So you could also argue it's being, it's trying to be too ambitious and sort of spreading itself too thin. So that's a hard, I, I, I oscillate in terms of whether I think it's being over conservative or over ambitious and dynamic. Um, I think probably both is true to some extent. I think the, these policy and issue champions have been critical, but actually they really lack the kind of support and development and sort of retention within the organization. So many of them are sort of either burnt out or leaving the city or just despairing the fact that not enough's happening. Um, and that makes it a, you know, a hard task within the city. And then I think one of the big things is this: there's not enough attention in a city like Cape, Cape Town given to questions of equity and justice in terms of how we're de dealing with, Cape, with climate change. It's very much assumed that everybody must reduce emissions and everybody should benefit from water savings and everybody should get access to infrastructure, which of course is true, but some people are very far ahead than others. And so I think probably we need to focus a little bit more on the sort of social justice elements of climate change in a place like Cape Town. Um, going back to, yeah, to the issue of wicked problems, we can't rely on authoritative strategies because climate change isn't that kind of problem. A bit of competition is healthy because it can stimulate innovation, but ultimately, really, we need a lot of collaborative work around bringing together multiple expertise, multiple knowledges, multiple viewpoints to tackle what is a very wicked problem. Um, and so sort of managing and investing in networks is really critical. So to conclude very quickly, um, I think it's fair to say, I hope I've convinced you that climate change is definitely a wicked problem, maybe even a super wicked problem. The city of Cape Town is definitely a m massively complex organization, and that the combination of those two results in a big headache, very difficult to agree on what we should be doing, difficult to coordinate, difficult to finance, difficult to evaluate, but there is progress being made. Um, it's not the case that we just wait, you know, there's an optimal solution around the corner. There's no silver bullet to climate change. So we've got to just keep trying, keep building capacity within the city, keep learning from what we're doing to see what's working and what's not, keep realistic, not assume that we can tackle this thing immediately, but remain ambitious in terms of our efforts. And then I think as kind of constituents of Cape Town, outside of the city of uh, are not necessarily as employees of the city, but I think it's really incumbent on us as academics, as residents, as everybody who enjoys living in Cape Town to try and be kind of critically constructive and, and engage the city on what can be done and make whatever contribution we can to helping that happen because it's definitely not the kind of problem that the city uh, with a capital C that local government can solve on its own. So thank you very much. Admittedly, not many, Five much time questions. for questions. Please put up your hands. I can see quite a few. Mm. I'm going to start at the back. I'm just interested to know, you said that Cape Town is a very complex organizational structure. How does it compare with other cities? In South Africa, it's not dissimilar because a lot of that structure is determined by the national legislation around how municipalities need to be set up. So from the other metro municipalities like Joburg and Durban, it's not hugely dissimilar. And there's some dis, uh, differences in terms of how they choose to cluster things. So for example, whether water and sanitation are housed together or separately, whether stormwater is, our stormwater unit is with transport and not with water, whereas it might be different in another city. So there's some differences. Um, and then as I said, it varies 
quite a lot with certain other countries where they don't have these mega unified city municipalities, but rather they have eight, ten small local municipalities that make up a city, um, sometimes with a, a sort of um, almost like an HQ sitting above them, but it's a very different um, setup from the way ours are structured. So that's why I was saying it's hard to compare between cities across the world because the, the frameworks within which they work, which are usually nationally determined, are quite different. Um, but but in a South African context, Cape Town's not massively dissimilar from, from other metros. Obviously, local other local municipalities that are more rural, it's very different because the scale is very different. Oh, I, I don't know if that's a, an, I mean, I think we have to work with what we've got, and I think a lot of thought, I, I'm not an expert in sort of design, government design. I, I, from what I gather, a massive amount of thought went into the redesign in the transition from 2004, and South Africa is often credited with having, you know, very state-of-the-art sort of design principles built into its government um, and its constitution and its laws. So I think we're probably working with a fairly good system, actually. Um, but that's not really my area of expertise. Um, and, but I think, it, yeah, I think by, by many accounts, Cape Town stacks up quite well against other parts of the world. So it can't be a terrible system. I'm coming to you. Um, solid waste management. Yes. Yes. Um, how do we compare with other countries? Terribly. <laughs> yes, terribly. So I w when I was putting together that table, yeah, um, when I was putting together that table of of the awards, it's interesting that a lot of awards have been won for ma massively ramping up. Um, recycling and reuse initiatives in cities. And some cities are being, being very ambitious about being zero waste by 2025, 2030. But yeah, Cape Town is not, is not doing so well on that front yet. And interestingly, I mean, there's a big, one of the problems in some ways is, or it's been used it's one of those things where you're never quite sure if it's being strategically used as an excuse or a valid reason. But one of the things in the Municipal Finance Management Act says that municipalities basically have to take the cheapest option. Otherwise, they're considered wasteful expenditure. And the cheapest option per weight of waste is to take it to landfill. It's more expensive to recycle. So you often hear the waste people saying, and I, I'm not, my, I don't have a good brain for remembering numbers, but they'll tell you X amount of rand per kilogram to, to landfill versus recycling, and we can't justify issuing contracts for recycling when it's much cheaper to do this. Obviously, many others will say that's only one component of the Municipal Finance <coughs> Management Act, and it's being used as an excuse because they're petrified of not getting a clean audit, which is why, how the city manages to get all its money. Um, and that actually these other reasons